All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the 146th episode of The Get Down, brought to you by Digital Music Pool. My name's Cream. Gary W. here. It feels like we haven't talked in such a long time because the last time we recorded, we had a guest, Madison from 4AM, which is a great episode. Yeah. And then we didn't record last week because guess what? I'm, I was sick shocking. again for like the fourth time since Thanksgiving. Shocking, shocking. <laughs> Dude, I'm, I'm, I'm having a rough time out here. It, it's, not, it's not good. Yeah, I don't know. I, I know that like sickness and whatnot has been kind of going around up there for months and months and people have been having certain things linger about for, for a long while and I think that's what's going on there. Just overworked, overstressed, not enough sleep. I had a, the weekend before I got sick, I like drank a bunch. I worked on Sunday for Super Bowl. It's just like a recipe for me not doing well. Yeah, you know, you know kind of what works for you and what doesn't. And I think that you have to follow a, a better regimen. I think that goes for a lot of people. Like, you know, don't don't overwork yourself if you if you know that things are cause a negative effect on your life, you know, if you do it, like don't don't push yourself too hard you know there's no reason to do it because honestly what happens it 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 takes away from things in the long run you know like if like for that one day of work like it kills five days of work well i dj'd two nights two weeks ago with with a fever yeah it was the most sick i've ever been while djing it was terrible i was up in mohegan sun there was no way i was canceling that gig and then the next no. night we were supposed to have Jake Shore at Birch, but we had weather, so we ended up pushing that that event. Uh, luckily, I had Solano come DJ with me, and I'm like, dude, I got to go home. Like, I can't even – I'm like – I was standing in the DJ booth, and I thought I was literally going to go down. Like, I was, like, <laughs> spinning. I'm like, I got to go, bro. I'm out of here. <laughs> Thank God we had Solano there then. I was bummed that Jake couldn't come through because I was in that weekend, and I thought we were going to make a weekend of it, and uh, – and then it, it snowed for the second time or the third time in two trips of me being up in, in Jersey. I'm just yeah, happy I was, to be I was here. excited to hang with Jake and kind of let him uh, hear him play and, you know, setting up that special event at Birch with the DJ booth on the dance floor. Like it was a lot of cool things that were supposed to happen. So yeah, we pushed that date to April. So it'll still happen. I'm just, uh, you know, kind of bummed it didn't happen last week. But I guess being sick, it was it was a, you know, right. A little it works out the sky kind least, of a thing. Selfishly. Yeah. Yeah. So that so works. I, I want to start this episode. I think this might be a little bit of a controversial conversation or some people might get upset or triggered about this, but I want to make the statement that I think right now in early 2024, DJ skills have never been as unimportant as they are right now. And I don't say that because I don't think having a skilled DJ in a venue is important. I think the people who are making the decisions, the venue managers and owners and bookers, just don't care about DJ skill and care more about a lot other a lot of other factors that they think are more important. Yeah, and, the, and that factor is making money, right? I think that kind of it depends on the you know on that on that high end on that higher end level is what you're speaking of correct no just really? in general period cuz i had a i had a conversation with an uh one of the managers and ownership and then also one of our DJs about kind of being more technical because the venue wanted to have like a cleaner DJ they wanted to have you know they were they were focused on this the one of the parts of the skill sets of DJing right whether that's transitioning and then flow of night right so like that I feel like is not as important as ever but more people know and are privy to what a bad mix sounds like if that makes sense yeah so like I, I feel like on the low level. Like you still, you need to sound clean and you need to have a nice flow to, to your night. Right. So I, I think that's important. Like, the, the I guess I'm basics. always talking about high level. Like I don't, I don't care about the, the, like whatever the regular local bar where you just throw a DJ in there kind of thing. I, I don't, I, I guess that I'm not talking about that. Right. That's what I was asking. You're not talking about that. No, I'm talking about like the places that that I DJ in, or the places that 
the more club style places for sure, where there's potential for ticket sales and bottle right. service and so less so like the local bar. I mean, that's the, the, you know, the percentage that you're talking about is like a 5%, 10%. Like that's 10% of the market. That's not 90% of the market is your local place. 10% of the market is what you're talking about, right? I think they're completely different. I think you've, we've gone, it's reversed from where it was 10 years ago. Right, ten years ago, it was like you want DJ, you want skilled DJs in the DJ booth in your nightclubs. You want they, you want technical DJs in the DJ booth at your nightclubs, at, and those are the people that they're going to sell tickets and and whatnot. And now it's more like, well, whatever brand rep it is that m- might be some social media influencer or, um, like I said, like somebody who comes came out with a brand and 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 is now like big on TikTok or big on Instagram and like those people getting booked. Yeah. That's where it's really not important. You can stick anybody up there. They've been DJing for six months and they're playing some of the biggest rooms in the country. Yes. Yeah, so how it's so backwards to me. It's so it just, backwards. It's so shot out. And now in the small places that you're not talking about, they're looking for people that are cleaner, people that can, that, that, that know how to ha- build a flow to a night that know how to, you know, not go too heavy too early. It, it's gone completely, completely backwards. I think it's rare for the person who's making the decisions in those lower level places to actually have any idea what any of that stuff means. But what makes you say that? Because what, ha- what happened was in, in the last 10 years is that people that are in, even into local DJs listen to mixes. They'll listen to, you know, uh, SoundCloud and different DJs mixes. They're more privy to what a clean mix sounds like is my point. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, like, I guess it, there's a broader if you're spectrum. Being booked as a professional DJ, like you gotta mix cleanly. Like, no, is that not like a minimum? I, I think that I think that we sometimes take that for granted. There's many DJs getting booked that sound like shit. I watched three DJ, DJs. I went and like we're checking out some local guys to see, like you know, check out local talent, and I saw three particular DJs that played pretty good rooms that couldn't mix, couldn't mix, and they were playing big clubs in new york city that most people would like to play at and i'm listening i'm like how the fuck did this person get booked for anything a bar mitzvah even terrible and so you and i i think take for granted that clean mixing is for you to get hired at a place you should be able to mix two songs together that's not the case across the board it's just not because anybody can dj right now Right, and I know that's the old man thing to say, and but I don't care because that. No, that's I don't the think truth. it's the old man thing to it's, say. I think it's it's the barrier to entry and become a DJ is way, way, way lower. It's it, it you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing. I think it's a good thing because it allows more people to enter the space. It yeah. puts more of a light on you know what we do, even though the art form to me is sort of missing right now. Um. So yeah, like it's it's a good thing, I guess. More DJs are learning how to DJ, but it is. I, I say to people all the time, like I could teach you how to mix two songs together in one hour, right. but for you to be able to play a night and be successful and quick mix and move around and read a crowd, like that takes years and years of understanding and practice and experience. And so many people have this like low level of skill and think they can DJ, but they really can't as a DJ that's out. And working for a venue. A lot of the places that you're playing right now also are more artist driven, I guess, where like you're getting away with playing like, you know, 128 mostly, like in that realm, 128 to 140, you know, drop it to, to 70. It's not super, super open format, but that's what's popular right now. That's what's selling. That's what is selling tables and everything. And the, the like, um, battle style has kind of gone away you know the i know we bring him up a lot but he is always the 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 milestone D, the dj am style has kind of faded away outside of the bottle service clubs that are selling big tickets you know and i think because there is such a far um departure from that and now we're into just like this it's just a different world it's just a different different type of music it's more edm forward that I think the the yeah the art quote unquote is is lost a little bit because you know it's I feel like there's such a departure between a big EDM DJ and somebody who's so technical like in like a A track. 
am I going to be a dick by saying, like, it's pretty easy to be a house DJ? It, like, on, on the basic level? Like, a, it's way a... easier to be a house EDM DJ than it is to be an open format DJ that's dancing in and out of genres and, and BPMs and doing that smoothly than just playing 128 to 140 throughout your set. Like, listen, I do both. Like, the yeah. nights where I'm just going one speed, it's like, you don't even have to think. You're just playing... I'm just playing EDM and and techno and house and bang like it's one speed. I don't really have to think and I just kind of go through it. Whereas yeah. when I play open format, it's more of a challenge for sure because you really are reading a crowd more so and you're understanding what's working in the room and what isn't. And you got to move around and you got to figure out how do I go from 130 BPM to 100 BPM? And then in five songs, get back to, you know, 140 or whatever, you know, like right. I, it's easy to be a house DJ in most cases, right? Like the James hype level is, I was is just a completely say, different thing, right? James that's hype that's and bringing a technical aspect to DJing that most people can't even imagine doing. Right. James, we're hype. not talking about that. <laughs> right, a, and, and like people, people probably or a track, right. a track, a track, like like a track was the the DMC world champion, and then also became one of the more, you know, he's a, he's a popular uh, house producer as well, um, and integrates both of those things. Excellent, like you know, probably the best of anyone in his sets. So yeah, completely different story, but and that's what set those guys. That's what sets those guys apart, is that they they do they're able to integrate both styles. Right? Right. I asked this question on Twitter a couple months ago, and I still don't have an answer, but we talk to a ton of young DJs, right? We have uh, DJs fill out forms so we can get a better idea of who they are and what they do. Like 99.9% .9 of the DJs we talk to want to play and make house music. There's no open format DJs. There's very few DJs that want to play hip hop. Like, I, it's very rare. Is, is there an up and coming open format DJ that you look at as like the next big thing? Cause I can't think of any. Oh man. I don't know. Listen, I'm sure there are, but just like off the top of my head, like the point I'm trying to make is there are very few DJs that are like, I want to be an open format DJ. I want to be more of a hip hop Latin DJ. It's more rare than I want to be a house DJ. Be because of wh where the fame and where the money has gone, right? And that's yeah, why. Yeah, for sure. That's why. Like, it, it's a great, uh, you know, Rick Wonder is a great example of somebody who was a gr an amazing and still is an amazing open format DJ, and it's changed his brand to be a house EDM producer DJ, and his career skyrocketed because of it. Well, because he transitioned with the times, right? Right, but Rick is also like the best DJ in our market kind of thing too. You know, it's but not like a, Rick's a middle of the road guy. He's one of the best DJs in the country. I think he went from, you know, one of the one like top 10 DJs in our market to being the top DJ in our market because he changed his brand, because he changed the direction he he was going in and then what well, was and then highlighted himself, "Hey, I'm the <laughs> biggest New York City DJ and now I'm going to be able to travel because of that." Right? And maybe if he stays in the open format world and he doesn't start to produce house music, he's still just in that top 10 conversation probably, right? Right. Like he, he made a conscious deci decision to get involved with what's popular, what's going to make money. Yeah, right? I mean, I think he also, he got more focused, more brand focused, you know? Right. Instead of being a generalist, he got way more specific where it was like, hey, this is what I do now. This is what I'm about. And these are the style of rooms that I'm going to book based on the music that I'm making and the music that I want to play. And that's, you know, that's, that's hard to do. Yeah. But I think Rick's not only skilled as a DJ, but he's also really skilled as a marketer and, you know, uh, creating a brand and, and positioning a brand. And I think the combination of those two things have allowed him to really, like you said, skyrocket to being like the guy right yeah. now. Yeah. I, I, you know, I think when you're coming over from being an open format DJ to trying to be a, a, a straight up house DJ, there are things that you can carry over that keep, will keep your sound a little more interesting, keep your set more interesting. I'm sure you could speak to this a little more. Like, are you using certain, um, are you using certain mixing techniques like in your, in your artist sets that you would use like in an open format set? Or do you kind of keep it pretty basic? Um, 
like what? I mean, yeah, like I, I'll use wordplay and I'll I'll do some thing like I'm using loops and I'm not I'm not like the most technical DJ to begin right. with as an open format DJ. Like I could do some basic things and I have some like little word plays and transitions that I've created that work. Yeah. But I would never call myself like a technical DJ really. Yeah. Understood. But I was just wondering if maybe that's if, is that something you think about like when you're when you're doing a artist set that like hey like can I incorporate some some more open format skills in here? I don't know. It's probably something that I would be thinking about if I was playing that set. I would that, say, that kind of I think coming from that open format background, like 99% of my sets, I'm going to bring some sort of other genre into my set, even if it's expected of me to just play four on the floor most of the night. Right. Maybe that's trap, right? Maybe that's just like hip hop vocals in a Jersey club track, or just like some way to sort of sh show, you know, that those open format roots, I guess you would say. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's funny because we speak about how there is this huge transit, not transition. There's this, this huge push for just being an EDM DJ, EDM producer. I feel like that's very specific. I feel like that's going to be specific to different markets, right? So like our market, that is what's kind of big right now. Right. But I think if you go down to Philly and you come down here to Orlando, like turntablism and battle DJing, like that's still the core of the people that get together for like a DJ meetup. Yeah. That's the core of it. Like it's mostly people that are battle DJs and like are very interested in the culture of DJ. Right. So I, I feel like it's a very market specific thing, though. The overall landscape of DJ and DJing and nightlife across the country and across the world is really focused on EDM and house. Um, there are still specific places where uh, like the art form is still there and strong. Yeah, no, I think we I think we've done a bad job of like pushing the culture forward as far as the technical side of DJing because you and I aren't in that world necessarily, you know? Right. Maybe, not that we have done a bad job, but I I think maybe that's something that like we can try and and create more of in our market, right? Like like you said Philly like it's very Nico Oso and all the young guys like Nick Nack right. and all those guys are very skilled technically yeah. and i think like you said it's just in the culture of that dj group in philly where you know they're meeting up for just like sessions you know and mm -hmm. like k fry is another great example like great great skilled great. dj yeah great technical dj but there's a lot of there's a lot of those guys in philly there's a lot less up here in in northern jersey new york city i think because of the ba that's the barrier to entry in their market. You have to be technically skilled. If you're not technically skilled, you're not getting looked at for a second. You could work a room all day long, right? And that, and that's good for if you're trying to get booked at an iClub, you're trying to make somebody money. But like within the the group that might be putting DJs on at spots, like you're not going to get looked at unless you're technically sound. And that's why all those guys they, I feel like they start technical and then they can learn the like DJ side, like the, the DJ side of it, meaning like, you know, how to build a room and right. you know, how to, how to build a night and all that, all that good stuff. I feel like that's great for that stuff to come second. It's great to build those technical skills first. Yeah. I feel like that's where I, I started in trying to build technical skills and like setting up my turntables battle style and having battle style mixers and buying two LPs at a time. And I was something I was really interested in when I was, 14, 15, 16. And then when I started to work out when I was 17 and play nightclubs and stuff like that, I learned how that wasn't so important. And it also didn't translate at that time, right. right? Because people weren't so privy to, you know, you had to be in the DJ culture to know what the DMC world championships were in 1998, 1999, 2000, right? Like, because YouTube wasn't a thing and, and, and whatnot. So it wasn't so readily available for people. So that's where I started, but I wound up being, I, I kind of left that by the wayside to make money. And so I felt like that that's, I still feel like that's a really great way to start, like start with that, the technical stuff. Right. And I then think nobody's starting with that. Now everyone's just starting well, no, with like just four on the floor house. Oh, I you know I'm, I'm plugging, playing John summit. That's what I'm doing. Right. I'm mixing John. You know what I mean? And like, I'm right. just mixing house tracks instead of, instead of like really learning a lot of different genres and, but that's okay. That's okay. Because if, if you have one focus and that's what you want to do, then you do that. Right. Um, 
Yeah, and it like just you said, it's, just, it's what's popular right now, right? Like, right. you go on social and you see the big festivals and you get the FOMO because you're not there. And, like, that's sort of this, like, the DJ dream now, right, is to go play the big festivals and, you know, make that rise to to traveling DJ and festival DJ. <clears throat> but I don't know. I, I started this whole thing, and I, I wanted to talk about this just because – I want to see more of the technical side of things. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in sets, right? Because I, I don't know if the technical DJ stuff necessarily translates in a nightclub, right? Many times the customers don't even know what's going on. The the times where I find success, I'll literally get on the mic and like call out what I'm going to do kind of thing. Or <laughs> like be like, watch this or like you got to like kind of like have that conversation with your audience if you're going to do something different or weird or cool whether it's you know a, a, a tone play or a word play or just something that's different you'll have like a handful of people in the crowd be like oh shit i i know what he just did there but right most people have no clue but yeah. my challenge would be like dj is put out more content that is that is more technically driven or practice on some technical things I, that that's my challenge and it, it's sort of a challenge to me that i i'd like to to work on a little bit on my own is just kind of push push this being a real dj thing in in what we do and not just like all the business stuff we talk about and growing your business and i don't know it's honestly the well i, I can't speak for everybody but it's the fun part of djing for me, at least, yeah. that's what's fun to me. Like, yeah, building a night's good and getting crowd reaction to songs that they know is fine. But like when I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to call it Monopoly I actually did like a live Michael Jackson mix that like caught my eye on social media yesterday because he did this Michael Jackson event over in New York City. And he did this mashup live and I, like I got super excited about it. Like I because I love to do that stuff. I like to surprise myself. And you can tell that he surprised himself while he was doing it. And because that's the fun part of DJing. And I love that like stems has been introduced because people can get more creative and yeah. get more, you know, I, I, I I'm going to bring this up too. somebody did one of those live mixes. Um, and then they posted it on social media and every idiot in the comments, like that's not in key. Like that doesn't work. It's not in key, but it, it flowed fine. Like it doesn't have to always be in key. Like it sounded good. You know, just because it wasn't technically, you know, both the same key, like I don't care as long as it sounds good. I didn't hear it, but no, 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 not the not the Michael Jackson one I'm uh, talking about. Okay. There was a different mix that I really was into. You're like and in I key is like the only thing that I might uh, push back on. But it sounded good. It didn't matter yeah. that like, oh, okay, like the hook and the beat, like where the beat was going to go into that portion of their hook. Like he was just looping the beat, and then like the hook came on, and like yeah, it was it was okay, and it wasn't like. But it's not supposed to sound like you're coming out of the studio. You're doing it live. I think that's that's a portion of what people I think get scared of too. Is that people are so overly protective of being in key and being really, 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 really clean and like you're supposed to fuck up. That's that's the part of DJing and and messing around. That's that's fun, right? Because now how can I go back and make that better? Make it sound better and maybe introduce an effect here or something like that. And it gets the, the wheels turning. That's all the fun stuff. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I think that, that's the fun portion of DJing for me is, is messing around. Well, I think, I think that's what's different for everybody, right? Like it might be the fun part for you, but some other people might not care about that at all. Right. And just want to play house music and love tech house. And like, yeah. that's it, you know, and maybe they just want to be the best tech house DJ that they could possibly be and go the Rick wonder route and be very focused, you know? Yeah. Understood. I mean, yeah, it's different strokes for different folks. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I just, I started that off with the comment of, I don't think skills matter or I, what, I don't, what did I say? I, I said, I think skills are like the least important that they've ever been in our right. Industry. Is it, is it less important? Right. And it is, it is less important. I think that's on a absolutely level, true. The, the, one of the reasons why I brought this up, I, I saw a video uh, about people or DJs or someone killing Charlie Jordan uh, for, for some Vegas set that she was playing. And like 
the one video that I saw that like it wasn't very energetic or whatever. And someone was just like, they're really letting anyone DJ now, right? Like, I don't know anything about Charlie Jordan. I'm just using this as an example. Okay. But like owners and venues, like they could care less about skills. They could care less if you're putting a mix on. If, if the person that they're bringing in is selling tickets and making the venue money, that's all they care about in most cases. In most cases. Because this this like nightclub high end bottle service thing is hurting right now across the industry at least in the US and venues are looking for any way to get their numbers up and they don't care about DJ skill they just care if the person they're booking has interest and people are going to buy tickets and people are going to come that's all they care about on the Vegas level and on a local nightclub level because i have those conversations and all they care about is, well, how many tickets are they going to sell? How many people are going to get in the door? How many bottles are we going to sell? Those, that's what they care about. That's it. Do you think it's acceptable to put a mix on? As a DJ? Yeah, in as, a nightclub? Hell no. What if it's a DJ producer that sold a bunch of tickets and they, you know, they have a couple hit records? You learn how to DJ and get the job done at a minimum. I, that's just me. All right. So this might be a different conversation. So, but... I'm going to ask. So how about when like Swedish house mafia puts well, a mix on? I don't care about on. that because you, people, people are going to a festival for not just the music, but for the production and the cryo and the visuals. And in order to do that the best so way possible. Different. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, you're paying for a, a show. Like you're not paying to go to a nightclub to hear okay. somebody DJ and curate a, a playlist of the night. Like they're planning their sets. The visuals match up. The, the pyro matches right. up. Yeah. And like you're going to experience that. Right. So I don't care about that. Okay. And I know Swedish House Mafia can DJ. So like <laughs> I just want I just wanted to make the, the, the distinction there. But like if if you're a if if you're a bedroom producer and you make a hit and all of a sudden you're getting booked to go DJ, yeah, you better fucking spend the next month learning how to DJ so you could DJ. Avicii used to get absolutely murdered when he first started. Killed. Because he never wanted to be a DJ. That was not his intent. He wanted to produce music, right? But they made him go out on the road and play. Right. Like, and I, rem you and I remember seeing You got to. That's how you make your money. I remember seeing him a couple of times. I'm like, oh, my God. Like, he played surf club one night, one day and then saw him probably a couple of years later, and he did the pier. And he had gotten way better in that in between that time frame. But yeah. he couldn't, like, he didn't know how to build a room. He couldn't mix two records together. It was It was a hot mess. But... They made him get out there and do do that, and he did get better. But he would get absolutely roasted for how unskilled he was as a DJ. But he was not supposed to be a DJ, right? right? He's a producer that had to learn how to DJ, I'm, and that happens a lot, you know. Like, right. there's a lot of producers that just want to make music that don't want to go travel and DJ, you know, which is opposite from a lot of the people that we talk to. Everyone wants to DJ and go out on the road and make hit, make a hit that allows them to go. DJ a festival and yeah. play a big room and all that stuff. Yeah. It's just crazy how the, the, the art form has evolved in so many different ways. And there's so many different ways to go about it. And, you know, there, there was a time when you could just produce and just put out records. You didn't have to go DJ. Right. Yeah. But like that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Like, and vice versa, you could have been a big DJ and never put out a record. But that doesn't exist anymore, right? So, you know, the the landscape is is quite unique right now, and there's a million different ways to get into it. It's hard, right? Like, I, I think a challenge right now too is that uh, some of the bigger artists are just so expensive. It's really hard as a promoter or a venue owner to make money bringing these people in. You know, like I know. Uh, I was talking to somebody who had, we had Tiesto in New Jersey at the American Dream Mall and they sold a shit ton of tickets. But like the event wasn't successful from a financial standpoint because it's just so hard to bring someone like a Tiesto in and sell enough tickets and sell enough bottles where you can even out, you know? Yeah. I, I think like these, the prices are getting so extreme on the high level. It makes it really hard for anyone except the the largest festivals or like Vegas or the largest clubs in the world to be able to even bring these artists in. Is this Vegas's fault? 
Is this where this started, you think? Is this the Calvin Harris X amount of dollars for a residency? Probably. Is that where it started, you think? I, I mean, I think so. Yeah, I, I, w- I would assume the festival, the festival circuits probably, you know, these guys are commanding as much money as they can. I don't blame them, you know? If someone's going to pay me $250,000 to DJ, yeah, sure, why not? Yeah. You know? I know that Tiesto, when he played like the Roxy and he played Exit back in the day when I'd go see him, he was getting 40K a night, which back then was a lot. But those are mega club. Like Exit on a Saturday night when he would play there would get 5,000 people in there. You know, and you're selling bottles and you're selling a liquor and you have a big cover chart. I four, it was $40 back then to get in. Right. So like they were make they could make their money then on 40K, but like. Now when it's 250k, like how do you even and and the ticket prices haven't moved still, right? You're still walking in for 40 bucks or 50 bucks or 60 yeah. bucks, right? Depending on what level of ticket you get. It, it that you're right. I think the artists have gotten too expensive. And you know, it, I don't understand how anybody makes money in 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 this in this landscape. I know how much money it costs to get John Summit to Atlantic City for a day party and like I don't think it's possible to make money on that event. But maybe you look at it like, all right, we're going to bring awareness to our venue and we're going to have a really successful day. We're going to bring John Summit. We're going to get incredible photo and video and use this to promote our place. And hopefully we bring new customers in and like maybe, but yeah, that's a- you could only do that once, you know, right. <laughs> like-, like once a year. <laughs> and then like, like now you've set the bar of John Summit. So are people going to ex- get excited about like a $10,000 DJ when you just brought in someone for over $100,000 kind of thing? Are those $10,000 DJs, is that the value? There's got to be a value somewhere. There has to be. Is it the local DJ? I think the value <laughs> is like the really high end travel DJ that can step into any room and make you money as a venue. And then you can position it as the DJ from New York City, the DJ from Miami, the DJ from LA. I I don't know. I don't know if there's value. I don't think there's any value. <laughs> like Yeah. Well, I think that DJ that you're speaking of, like that's what I'm saying. Like, what's the that DJ and the five thousand dollar DJ, they're all the same, right? What, like the fifteen hundred dollar, two thousand dollar yeah. regional DJ, US right. DJ? Right, regional DJ is probably the best way to describe it. But like, is that regional DJ a better DJ than the five thousand dollar artist? Probably. I'd say in 100%, some cases, I'm sure. Time. You know. <laughs> yeah. It's just I a tough. Know. It's a tough. It's a tough market, man. And like, me getting thrown into this like talent buyer role, which I've never done before, right? And it's like. I'm sort of trying to figure this out, right? Like at what price point does it make sense kind of thing? At what price point are we going to sell tickets and still be able to make money kind of thing? Yeah. I I would not want to own a nightclub. Not in this landscape. No, no way. For so many reasons. You know, like just rents are high and just the price of everything is so high. Like how can you, how can you profit? Yeah, it's it's tough, especially in any of the major markets where all that stuff is exacerbated even more, you know? That's why sometimes those smaller markets have fantastic nightclubs. Yeah. Because the overhead... Right, because the rent's lower, the overhead's lower, and you could spend money on an incredible sound system and lighting and, like, really make a really cool place. Yeah. I mean, the fact... Think about the fact that Danny Teneglia travels around with his stacked sound system... For a show, because those kind of sound systems just don't, re- they, they, they're not, they don't really exist anymore as good as they are, as good as that what it is, you know? Yeah. Because in our market, he can travel around with that and shit on any sound system in, in the market, you know? And I, I don't know, like, because our market is so damn expensive for rent and for, you know, you just, you don't spend the money on that kind of thing anymore. Yeah. Because does it really make sense to? Like you could get, you can get by with, you know, you don't have to go half a million dollars or whatever it might might be for sound. You're saying or for right. whatever, just to build out. But I'm just thinking about just like the different, like different things that have 
been taken away in the bigger markets that are more expensive for like rent and overhead. I don't know, just offhand. I was it's just a saying. crazy landscape right now, man. It's it's hard. And you know, we we talked about it previously, but like, yeah, and you just brought it up. I would not want to be an owner in this climate, you know? It's just tough. It's it's a tough, it's a tough economic market. And then it's sort of like it it's we're in the middle of like a wave, right? Like what's we we don't really know what works for local right now, you know? Yeah. I, you know, I, I was listening to a financial um, podcast the other day, and it's kind of funny because the, the ownership right now, too, especially in our market, like everybody's waiting for the financial you know, ball to drop and like nothing. And, and like, you know, there's going to be a, a, this recession or whatever. Like we've been two years waiting on a recession. It's never happened, you know, and I feel like. I don't know. I, does that have a, a mental effect on how these owners spend money? Yeah. You know, and that's that's a a huge part of it because you're expecting something to happen that never happened, and like maybe you didn't spend money in places that you could have to make your your venue better. I mean, there's so many different effects, and this is why you don't want to own a place, right? It's so hard though to say I'm going to spend fifty thousand dollars on a sound upgrade right now when you're looking at your year over year numbers and they're down, and you're looking at the number of bodies that are walking through your door and maybe they're down a little bit, and you're looking at the average spend per customer that walks through your door and it's way down. Yeah. So how do you how do you justify how do you justify like a huge purchase to improve your place? Yeah, you almost can't. It's really hard to, you know? Yeah. It's tough, man. It's tough. So, like, is is it just, like, buckle down, rely on your, like, solid local regional DJs to come in and put on the best performance they can, you know, keep those extra bodies at the end of the night? And, like, is that the, the recipe for success right now? I think I, I believe in that wholeheartedly. Obviously, it's what we do. Um, but I think it's, it's doing that and then doing your regional to, you know, next level up DJ, you know, twice a quarter, something like that. And so like you do your big spend, whether that's be, whether that's maybe every other month, that's probably a great way to go about it. Right. Or once a month on a, on a Friday, if you think that you can generate some bodies through the door on a Friday, because Saturday is going to be good anyway, you know that. Yeah. So you want to do it on a night that's that you're your numbers are going to be down a little bit um, and do that spend on that Friday and blow it out and make sure that like your marketing is good and make sure that you're, you're, you're promoting it far enough in advance and you're putting a little money into social media uh, ads um, because you know, anybody that's had to scroll through anything in the last couple of months, like you can't get past three, three posts without hitting an ad, like be on that, be on that shit. You gotta be, and you gotta be on it in advance. Um, I, I just think putting the right, tools behind the party and, and especially doing it on, like I said, like a Friday, I think th those are the, those are the things that are going to make you a little bit more money. Right. I think just trying new things, you know, and like it's trying to stay at the forefront of your market as a venue, right? Like just trying to do something different than what everyone else is doing. And you know, whether it is the, spending more on promo, right? Like maybe the ads and and because people are living on socials and like that's where you're going to find new customers. Maybe that's just the recipe, part of the recipe, right? Yeah. But I think like you got to try, you got to put the effort in and attempt different things. Some of them are going to work and some of them aren't. And I think that's okay, you know? It's okay for stuff to fail. But I think it's important to at least try and try and push the market forward and try and do something new and different. And your customers will tell you if it's a success or not. And if it yeah. is, you keep doing it. If it's not, you try something else. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. All right. We should probably talk a little music. Yeah. Get into our... So we've been seeing this now for the last year or so, I'd say. But I think the country music going more mainstream is sort of starting to reach its peak. We have a Beyonce album. We have a Post Malone country album coming. We have a Lana Del Rey country album coming. We see the rise of the EDM artists, guys like Vavo. Um, shit. They're at, the, they're at the forefront. Who are uh, a Lavish Life yeah. disco fries artist. 
um, you're seeing more and more of it, right? You're seeing younger country stars emerge that I think are connecting to a younger crowd. So I don't know. What are your thoughts? You, how, how do you think that's going to creep into our DJ life, if at all? Uh, gosh. Okay. Um, I play and have been and have played like very spectrum country for a long time. Right. And I think a lot of people have without even really noticing it, you know, the stuff that's super, super duper popular country music is, and always will be the most popular music in the United States of America. Bottom line, hands down, whether you like it or not, because you go anywhere outside of the metro areas that is predominantly the music that's listened to right i live in an area that everybody listens to country there's got to be 12 10 country radio stations just where i'm at right like it goes country i get i get country latin country latin pop and that's how when i when you go scroll through the radio that's how it sounds yeah um it just so happens. And Beyonce comes from a place where country was the number one type of music, right? She's from Texas. That right. is the heart and soul of where she's from and the musical landscape of where she's from. So it does make sense that she delves into this, um, into this genre. Where it has gotten popular across the board with like Alana Del Rey, Post Malone has always tickled the surface with country music, right? Yeah. With his guitar. He's always had a, uh, a country sounding guitar on records, it, you know, from day one. Um, so that's also not shocking. I like the fact that they are trying to push it forward into extreme mainstream pop, right? It's been pop forever, it, you know, Garth Brooks. And I, I mean, if you know, remember growing up, like you always had country music award shows, felt like it was on every month. Like it, it was always consumed by many people. Um, it just so happens that it's hitting that super pop. I mean, Taylor Swift's a country music. She's a country star first. Yeah. You know? So I, I think, I think it's, how do, how do I think it's going to creep into what we do? I, I just think there are going to be more remixes and there's going to be more playability uh, within the country landscape. And the, the big songs are going to be, remixed and made into big EDM tracks or right. drum like or drum song is the one that comes to mind because like I don't I play zero country I am on record for not being a fan of country music and like right. even that song was EDM like remixes were creeping into my sets because it got so big and was requested and good reactions every time I played a, a it's version un it's unavoidable and you can't not play it if you if you want to be a good DJ that's playing two crowds, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I you have to, right? You don't. You have I guess choice. you don't have to, but like, <laughs> there are certain songs that you just kind of gotta fit into the night. And for a while, that song was sort of one of those songs where you kind of just gotta fit it in. I like the fact that the availability of different type, different sounding remixes are they're at your fingertips. You just have to find what your sound is. What the remix that fits your sounds, your yeah. DJ, your DJ um, sounds, and I, I because you can find them. Yeah, I would say how we might see this creep into our world as DJs. I just think there's going to be more country spots, venues, or more venues that are doing like a country night potentially. Um, Will there be more country DJs? Something that we struggle with. I don't know. I mean, I've been the last few months. I've been mining for country DJs, <laughs> or at least DJs that like know the music and are willing to play a country venue once in a while. Hit cream up if you guys are a country DJ. You want a gig? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we're t we're testing out DJs at a at a venue. You know, we we just need we need more on the roster. We just have more options. Yeah, I think it's an it, it's. It's interesting. I like that it's that it's gotten a little more mainstream. I like that there's country bars popping up more and more in, in those metro areas. Like we actually don't even have them too many down here. Um, there's a few, but like nothing crazy. Yeah, I mean, I said if if I was opening a place, I'd probably look to open a country place just because I think there's opportunity. And with all of this push to the mainstream with the music, it just makes more sense to me in my brain. Maybe I'm wrong, but. 
to, does to it be... Does it fizzle? Does it what? go away? No, I mean, I think country music is going to be popular no matter what. But just like every trend in music, like certain genres get popular for a time. I think we saw like when Bad Bunny first got popular, we saw a big la- uh, push of Latin music into the mainstream. I think yep. right now we're seeing a little bigger push of country into the mainstream. And like, just like anything else, there's waves. And this will be a wave for a little while. And we'll see how long it actually lasts. But I, when I was bringing up those artists, and like, in no way was I saying like they're trying to take advantage of a trend. But I do think there are going to be artists that try to take advantage of the trend for sure. I think those three artists that we that I brought up earlier, like for sure, fit into creating country music based on their their past and where they're from, and you know their the music that they've already made. So right, but I right. do think there's going to be artists that are going to try to jump on this wave, just like artists try to jump on every other wave. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's the smart thing to do if something's trending. Like you know, you have to try it out, and especially if it's something that you're familiar with. And like I said before, so many. So many artists are very are intimately familiar with country because not everybody's from these you know New York City, LA, those areas, you know. So just get on it. I'm gonna make a country <laughs> remix. Wow, you and <laughs> you and country have already made a couple now. No, no, no. I'm, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be a uh, singing artist on the track. <laughs> I know what it's called already. I've, I've been known to freestyle a country song or two. <laughs> I won't do it for you guys right now, but <laughs> oh man, too good. If you guys see me out and uh, I might have had a couple cocktails, ask me to freestyle a country track and I'll do it. For you. <laughs> you better believe my pickup truck's gonna be in it, six pack, my dog in the back. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it sounds like a regular Friday. Down Shout here. to Big Country holding down the uh, the country music forever. Yeah, man. Yeah, me and Country have made a couple edits. We, he actually hit me up about doing a remix for a song. Um, he's built some really strong relationships over the last few years, and uh, he had an artist reach out to, or, or a label reach out to do a remix of something, so he had hit me up about it. I don't know if Country's on my, on my resume, though. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to hit Nashville? Do a Nashville uh You know what would be hilarious, stint? though? Like... I haven't been putting out a ton of original stuff, but like the the one track that'll go big will be the country thing, and I'll have to play country music, and that'll be like the, <laughs> <laughs> that'll be like my internal battle of, of... you want to see somebody's DJ career end quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that'd be that'd be hilarious, amazing, and terrible all at the same time. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, all right. So, one other thing I want to bring up, music wise. Um, Michael Jackson's estate just sold 50% of his music rights to Sony for $1.2 billion. And that broke the record by double uh, of Bruce Springsteen. Springsteen. Yeah, 600, right? Which I thought was big for Springsteen, 600. But he, he wrote, and just like, just like Michael Jackson, actually, was this, was, were, were the Beatles... Was the Beatles catalog part of this as well, or is this just Michael Jackson's music? Because Michael Jackson was known to buy, he bought rights to everybody's music for a long time in the eighties. There, he was just like going out there and snagging people's catalogs. Yeah, I, I think like it's he just was ahead his own of music. This. It was just his own music because he he had owned the Beatles rights, but I know there's a timeline on um, on owning the rights to to certain things. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if that was part of it, but I, it would make sense. If it was just his because Springsteen's was just his catalog. And like I said, like written, performed, you know, that's, that's all, that's their music. Right. Yeah. I mean, this um, is sort of getting more kind of more standard where these artists are selling their catalogs. It's such a huge, it's such a huge amount of money. Yeah. I mean, what, at, at what point do you, are you like, well, I don't care if Chevy uses my my any of my songs for uh for an ad you know i think it's more that's it's, why it's that's more just, why you hold on to them yeah right? well i think it was more because you know in perpetuity you're getting a percentage of plays from the radio and streams but i think there's less you know albums and cds and all that stuff is not really existent i know there's a little bit of a rise of people buying vinyl right now but yeah, not enough the, for it to make the it amount of money impact. that artists are making from streams is so minute that it's like right. 
it's not even worth it. You're better off just selling your catalog, you know, especially right. if you can command crazy hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Agreed. I mean, I think that, you know, Springsteen had made his money over and all of these artists that have. sold. I mean, look at uh, Katy Perry sold hers. Right. And she's and she could still create, you know, she's still I mean, creating music. She's still she's not like she's outside of this conversation of like an older artist. Yeah. You know, all these artists make their money touring. Like, look at the prices of concert tickets right now. Like, that's how it's they all crazy. make their money. Like lower yeah. bowl, lower bowl, bad bunny tickets, eight hundred dollars a ticket. Drake and J. Cole, like similarly crazy expensive. Yeah. Like, yeah, you can get in the building, but it's gonna be two hundred fifty bucks. Easy, easy to fifty just to, just walk to get in. in the building. Yeah. Crazy. It's got it's gotten wild. Yeah, I mean, we talked about the Beyonce and the Taylor Swift tours and and the crazy amounts of record breaking revenue that those tours brought in. That's where artists are making their money, right? DJ, we just talked about DJs commanding the more money than ever as as artists getting booked to play in different cities and festivals and stuff. Like that's how er, all of us are making our real money. It's not experience. from music streams, that's for sure. Yeah, everybody wants wants that experience. So, so Michael sets the record. Is Michael like the number one? Is he the number one all time? I think so. I, I don't think. I think for record, like for just. Sell your rights to your your music, absolutely. Is Michael the greatest pop artist of all time? He was. I said this actually to my dad, and he he yelled at me the other day. I was like, Michael Jackson was like the first huge big pop artist, and he's like the Beatles. Yeah, Did the Beatles. My the dad Beatles? used to always talk to me about like the <laughs> the crazy fanatical actions that people took to to see the Beatles. They just celebrated down here 50 years of the Beatles or 60 years of the Beatles coming here to Central Florida. Um, I didn't realize how, how like the big impact they had. Somebody wrote a book about it. Uh, so they had just celebrated 50 or 60 years of the Beatles coming to Central Florida. And it's like, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, these guys haven't been like relevant or like whatever in such a long time. And still people are talking about them coming like here 60 years, 60 years ago. <laughs> Like writing books about it, and Paul and McCartney will still sell out. Crazy, the, it, their impact is crazy. So like, they, they and Michael Jackson are huge, huge pop stars, right? Yeah, and probably the top two. Um, and it's just ironic that Michael Jackson owns the rights to there. What about what about current artists? Who do you think would be the number one if if every artist's Put their rights, their music rights up for sale right now. Who would sell for the most? Taylor Swift would be. Taylor Swift would if she sold her music rights tomorrow, she'd double Michael Jackson's. Because of just how hot she is right yeah. now. Yeah. And she's on this like Michael Jackson run. Like if you remember Michael Jackson back um late eighties, early nineties, and you would buy his concert on pay per view. It was like an event and you did it. You know, and, and my family would, would buy it every one every year, every year that he was on tour, and it would be like thirty bucks. It wasn't cheap. Yeah, it wasn't cheap. I would love to look at the numbers in that and like see how many pay per views he would sell back in like the bad tour or whatever whatever tour it was. She's on that kind of level, you know, where she is putting her her tour in in the movie theater and it's selling big numbers. You know, everything she touches, she can sell for a lot of money. Yeah, she's one of those people that has kind of transcended is now beyond just like a music star also. She's just a she's just an a, a pop star, you know? I think I posed this question a year or two ago. Is there ever going to be a pop star as big as Michael Jackson? And here she is. That might be controversial. I don't know but if I, I agree don't... with that, but I don't know if I disagree with it either. I'd have to really think about it. it. It's hard comparing the different eras, right? Especially because we're living the Taylor Swift thing right now. And but also, we're living in a social media era, which is... Which makes it easier. Which makes it easier, for sure. But that's what I was saying. Because, because everything is so fad and so fast, and so we consume it and throw it away, consume it and throw it away... It's easy for pop stars to be consumed and thrown away, and she is just stuck around. Yeah. And this this is an incredible, like meteoric rise to like this superstardom. Like she's 
always very popular, but now she's on like a completely different level. Yeah. Like think about the 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 Grammy where Kanye got up on stage and did what he did and disrespected her. Like that just seems like such a different time and she was so less popular then than she is now. And that was grant like winning a Grammy. <laughs> I think her popularity, when I was thinking about this question a year and a half ago, is completely on a different scale than it is right now, even a year ago, right? Like, Who else would even be in the conversation with Taylor? Is Beyonce in the conversation? Is Drake in the conversation? Is Bad Bunny in the conversation? This is one of those things, too, where it's like the the opportunity to make this purchase comes around once in a hundred-year span. So it's like... If there's one person that's willing to spend a crazy amount of money because they just want the catalog, it's like when a sports team comes for sale, right? Like the Yankees are valued at, let's say, $5 billion, but how often are the Yankees coming for sale? Like if they came for sale, right. they might sell for $20 million if there's or $20 billion. If there's, billion two, yeah. if there's two competing billionaires right. that want to buy the Yankees, you know? Yeah. I just think about Taylor Swift's popularity in the scope of – who would know who she is that she's not supposed to appeal to, right? So like somebody's grandma, somebody's great right. grandma, you know, everybody knows who Taylor Swift is. Every everybody knew who Michael Jackson was. Does everybody know Drake? They might have heard of him. They don't know what he looks like, right? Does everybody know Beyonce? That's probably a close one. You know, she's been in movies since 1998, 1999. Um so she's been popular for a very very long time. So she's a close second, I would say. Um, so who else? Bad, Bad Bunny. Like people know loosely who Bad Bunny is. He has rabid fans. You know, that's a, it's a little different. His fans are like super fans. Well, I think also if you talk to someone from South America or the Caribbean or a Spanish speaking country, that the conversation's a little different with Bad Bunny. Where like grandma's gonna know who Bad Bunny is, kind of thing in in those households. Whereas my grandma might not. You know. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think Taylor Swift transcends nation and, you know, uh, sex and age and everything, you know? I think that's why she's so big. I think it just reminds me of Michael Jackson at his peak. Yeah. You know, right after bad, right in between, like right before his Super Bowl um, appearance. Like, she's like that big right now, in my opinion. And I thought literally a year ago or two years ago, I did not think there would ever be another pop star as big as Michael Jackson because of social media, because of how fast we, we consume it. Yeah. Away. So it's interesting. I mean, guys, if there's any other artists you think are even in the conversation, like comment, let us know. Cause I'd, I'd love, I can't think of any others at the moment, but I'm sure there's probably one or two others that maybe might enter the conversation. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good point to wrap. Is there anything yep. that we want to promote and what anything we got going on? Guys, if you a couple things. Number one, if you haven't watched the show on YouTube, go give us a subscribe on YouTube. We're really trying to push more video content and push more people over to the YouTube. Um, so that's first and foremost. You could search get down DJs or click the link in the show notes. The second thing, uh, if you listen to this show, we would greatly appreciate you guys to throw us a review, hopefully a five-star review if you enjoy the show. Uh, that only just helps us get you know, in front of more people. It helps us grow the show and uh, get more listeners. So both of those things we greatly appreciate. And thank you guys for supporting us and listening to us. So, All right, good stuff. All right, guys. Thanks for listening to this episode. We will talk to you guys soon. Peace. Peace, guys.